Okay, a couple of videos ago, I asked you to look up a few different statements of the second law. And earlier in class, I said I thought it might be fun if you walk around to Olin faculty and ask them what they think the second law, what they think the second law is. And what I'm expecting that you found in both cases is that basically no two people walk around with the same statement of the second law in their head. Um, so this begs the question, is there one statement of the second law to rule them all? Uh, is there a statement that is any more that is more broadly a, applicable and more widely predictive than the others? Uh, I think so, and that's what we're going to try to do today. I wonder if you've already done this for Newton's laws. I know for me personally, I have to really scratch the back of my brain to come up with three sentences that describe the three laws of motion. But this equation sits right at the tip of my tongue. We've also done this for the first law. There's lots of different statements for the first law, and we haven't really bothered with them. We've mostly just tried to develop the reflex of thinking of the first law in terms of this equation. And then we modify it as we need to for the type of system and surroundings that we're looking at. So we're going to do the same thing with the second law. And an equation that describes the second law is that the change in the total entropy, and by total entropy, I mean we have to consider the entropy of the system and the entropy of the surroundings. The change in the total entropy must be greater than zero for a spontaneous change. So what's comforting about this is that it's quite tidy and easy to remember, and I think we already walk around with the impression that it's easier for entropy to go up, it's easier for disorder to take over. So there's something that aligns with our tuition about this equation. What's intimidating though is that basically I've just said that you can use this equation as long as you can calculate the entropy of the universe. So perhaps that's not very comforting. Um, the, the problem term here is this entropy of the surroundings, and so what we're going to do in the rest of this video is develop tools for calculating the entropy of the surroundings and then do a practice calculation. All right, so we have our thermodynamic definition of entropy, and now I'm going to be careful to specify system and surroundings. So the change in entropy of the system is equal to the heat flow in and out of the system divided by the temperature of the system. We have the same equation. The same equation applies to the surroundings. Notice too that because um, I've switched to the extensive properties here because we're going to end up having to compare two different materials and so it makes less sense to be thinking about these in terms of intensive quantities. Okay, so let's just picture this for a second. We have a system and we've got some heat flow into it. And if we flow heat into the system, I think our intuition and the equation tells us that we're going to increase entropy within the system. And if heat flows out of the system, we're going to decrease entropy in the system. Well, any heat that flows into the system or out of the system is flowing from the surroundings or to the surroundings. And so that's going to help us take care of this term here. So the Q in or out of the system is going to be equivalent to the Q from or to the surroundings. For the system, it may be the case that the temperature of the system is changing during this process. Actually, for many processes, it's very likely. And so if the temperature of the system is changing, we have to be careful about that when we go to integrate this equation out. It may not be the case that we can pull the temperature out of the integral. For the surroundings, however, where it would really be impossible to know how the temperature is changing, um, it's often the case that the surroundings are quite large and just like the heat reservoir and the cold reservoir that we use for heat engines, we're going to most often take the assumption that the temperature of the surroundings is constant. And for many, many problems, that's a pretty good assumption. 
So now we have all the tools to calculate to know this equation for heat flow. So we can integrate that equation and then the temperature of the surroundings is just pulled out of the interval. So let's do a practice calculation to solidify those tools. Um, practice problem that I think is nice is from your Atkins text. This is Atkins problem 3b1. And the problem asks you to consider a process where one mole of liquid water at minus five degrees C solidifies to ice at the same temperature. Our task is to calculate the change in entropy of the system, the surroundings, and the total change of entropy for this process. And hopefully what we find is that this total change in entropy is increasing. We should expect that because our experience tells us that liquid water below the freezing point of water will spontaneously solidify. So we're expecting these calculations to, to manifest the spontaneous change. We haven't done quite this. We haven't done um, phase changes. We haven't done chemical equations of phase changes in class. So let me just say that uh, phase change is simpler than you think. We can just think of this as a particular type of chemical equation. So the way I would write out this equation is that water, liquid water, at minus five degrees C is reacting to become solid water at that same temperature. To get at the entropy, we're gonna to have to calculate the heat. And from tools earlier in the class, um, we know that for a constant pressure process, we can relate the change in enthalpy to the heat. Um, and I think it's pretty good for this problem. I think a constant pressure assumption is pretty good for this problem. A problem though that you're gonna have is that we would start calculating the change in enthalpy for this reaction by going to look up the heat of fusion for these two substances in a table. But those tables aren't going to have values. Most of the tables we've looked at so far aren't gonna have values at 268 Kelvin. It'd be highly unlikely. So we can't do this calculation directly. I'm gonna then, I'm gonna now recommend that you pause the video and try to come up with a different strategy for doing the same calculation. All right, so if I think of this process as what's actually happening, but what's actually happening isn't very easy for me to calculate because I don't have access to the data I need. What I can do is lean on the fact that enthalpy is a state function. And so I don't have to use the process that's actually happening. I can invent any path I want to get from here to here. And in my experience, I just so happen to know what a calculable path is. So I'm gonna say in step A, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna heat liquid water up to the freezing point. I'm then gonna do the solidification reaction at 273.15K. And then I'm gonna cool the solid back down. So this is what's actually happening, but this path here is what's easier to calculate. So I'm going to use this path to do the calculation. Um, now the next step, I suggest that you pause the video. and make sure that you can write out the equations that you would need and the assumptions that you'd be making to do the calculations for each of these steps.
Okay, so step A was taking liquid water at 268K and heating it up to the freezing point. The thing I have to calculate is the change in entropy of the system in the surroundings. So for the system, this is gonna be equal to DQ over the temperature of the system. For constant pressure heating, this DQ is equal to CPDT. And when I integrate out, I get that the change in entropy for the system is going to be equal to CP times the natural log of T final for the system divided by the initial temperature for the system. For the surroundings, it's also equal to DQ divided by the temperature of the surroundings. DQ is the same as the heat of the system, but the opposite sign. And so I can write this as But I end up with a slightly different final equation because unlike up here, where I couldn't pull temperature out of the integral, here I can pull temperature out of the integral. So when I go to solve this equation, I get that the change of entropy of the surroundings is equal to Cp delta T. Divided by the temperature of the surroundings. Okay, I'm going to make similar, um, do similar derivations for the other steps. So B, this is the step where we solidify at the freezing point. And what I get for this problem is that delta S of the system is going to be equal to the heat of fusion. So heat of fusion is melting, and I put in negative heat of fusion because that's the opposite process is solidification, and it just so happens that I know I can look up this number. Divided by the temperature of the system. Now the temperature of the system stayed constant during this process, so it did pull out of the integral. And I get that the change in entropy of the surroundings is equal to the negative of this. For part C, where I'm heating back up, heating the solid, or cooling the solid, excuse me. I just have the opposite of part A. So now if you, uh, the next step would be to pause the video and to actually go execute on all of these calculations. So when I did that, um, I got the following values. 
and I will link on Canvas, I'll link to a Mathematica notebook that does these calculations. Your values might be slightly different, so our book doesn't necessarily have all the heats of fusion or heats of formation values or the heat capacity values that we need, so I had to look these up elsewhere, and depending on where you went looking for numbers, your numbers may be slightly different. But what's most important is that the change in total entropy for the full process is greater than zero as we expected. So make sure you give those derivations a try, arrive at the same questions that I did, or arrive at these same equations that I did, and give these calculations a try, and whichever precise number you end up with, <laughs> do make sure that the total entropy for this process is greater than zero. You could, if you wanted more practice, um, you could repeat this for different things that you know are spontaneous. So for example, you could do or not spontaneous. You could do this calculation. You could say, um, what would be the entropy for solidification at five degrees above freezing? Hopefully for this, your calculation ends up telling you that it's less than zero, so it's not spontaneous. You could also do this calculation for vaporization. So for example, if you decided to calculate the vaporization of water at 500 Kelvin, you should also calculate that this is spontaneous. Okay, good luck with the math.